Yes, 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 yes it's yes, that time it's again. again. It's Arawak, Arawak chat, chat with Professor Hot Stepper. Today is episode 23, entitled Away with Words, part one. Oh, that means it's going to be other parts. You know, the professor's cooking up some juicy stuff. But before we get into that juicy stuff, you know how we do. Triple on the rocks. Listen. You want to love me like you say, baby. I'm not a toy. Who you can play with, girl I'm just a man Who's searching for love Tell me now Tell me, baby What in the world Do you expect from me? Love is what you make Listen Love is what you make us Love is what you make us Love me Love is what you make us Love me I'm not a puppet no more and you can't pull the strings But promise you'd be true to me And I'll do anything, anything Love is what you make it good Love is what you make it good Love is what you make Love me Love, Love is what, what you make, make it Love is what you Say you will be true to me, and I'll do anything, anything. <laughs> Oh, wow. 
Once again, the sounds of the investigators, track entitled Love Is What You Make It, lifted from their album entitled Investigators, The Greatest Hits, circa 1991, and that comes courtesy of Sweet Freedom Records, and then was re-released in circa 1998, courtesy of Jetstar Records, and is available at all good music retailers and stockists. Make sure you go cop it. Here's the double. Listen. I will always do the good I can for a hatred I hate. And I hope you feel the same way too. The goodness of your words will carry you through. Do good unto others, and I will do the same for you. Give it a try, my friend, and you will prove what the thing is true. Love is the answer. There ain't no other. Oh, love is the answer. True love of the Father. If your neighbor come begging you something, don't say go and come tomorrow. Give it now while you can. And I know, I know, child will bless you. Oh, love is the answer. There ain't no other. We must exercise our love by forgiving and helping. We should teach others what they need to learn. Forgive them even when your heart burns. Love. I'm feeling love, lost to me. Love, I'm feeling. Oh, yeah. Love is the answer. There ain't no other. Oh, love is the answer. True love of the Father. Love is the answer. There 
Once again, sounds of the late great Mr. Garnet Silk, track entitled Love Is The Answer, lifted from his album entitled Love Is The Answer, circa 1994, courtesy of VP Records, and then was re-released in circa 1998 on the definitive Garnet Silk collection, circa 1998, and it's available at all good music retailers and stockists. Make sure you go cop it. <laughs> Here's the triple, and then we're getting into class. Listen. Thank you. 
Once again, the sounds of Mr. Carlton Livingston, track entitled Here I Stand, lifted from his album entitled Retrospect, circa 1997, and that comes courtesy of Jal Life Records, and then was re-released in circa 2015, and is available at all good music retailers and stockists. Make sure you go cop it. And yes, this is episode 23, Away With Words, part one. And without further ado, Professor Hot Stepper, over to you. Peace, what's good, everyone? Shout out to the chat and shout out to the ICCC and shout out to Gambler as well on the panel. Just at my post. All right, so today, guys, what we got for you is episode 23. So uh, we finished off last week on episode 22, right? And that was all to do with. Um, the concept of slavery and we was looking at modern slavery you know in places like um uh, barat some people know it as india we was even looking at uh europe as well you know central europe region um we was looking at asia with the lights of the lao Gai system in china as well um we've looked at you know even down to uh the enslavement of so-called you know white people or caucasians in uh you know, near to the Eurasian steppes as well, in fact. So shout out to everybody that came through and supported that little series that was going on. So I'm just going to go through the chat right now, see if we got today. So first person was Stacey Jones. Shout out to Stacey Jones. Big ups. Big ups. Salute. 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 Shout out to America. Sorry, America Autoton as well. Big ups. Big ups. Salute. Salute. Shout out to Chairman Inca as well. Peace. Mr. Inca, big ups. Salute. Uh, who else we got? Shout out to Blue as well. Peace to Blue. Blue, big ups. Salute. Who else we got? We got Amaru Jeans as well. So shout out to you. Big ups. Salute. And we've got the Empresses, Liz Robinson, Donette McCoy. And we've also got Cherokee Tolu as well. Shout out to the Empresses as well for supporting. All the Empresses, big ups. Salute. And we've also got Await the Red Pit as well. Shout out to Await the Red Pit. Big ups. Big ups. Salute. 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 All right. So um, what I'm going to be doing with you guys now, um, we're going to actually be looking at words and language. So we're going to be looking at the origins of certain words and where they come from. And we also will be looking at, you know, words from the Americas and how a lot of these words have crept into, you know, your modern languages of English, Spanish and French and how these words, you know, they're not English, they're not actually English or Spanish or French words at all, although they are found within these languages. A lot of these words are actually American Indian words. And we're going to be looking at, you know, how do languages die? Why do languages die as well? What threatens a language from existing? Um, we know that one talking point that comes up a lot, you know, when people try and substantiate, you know, that they're from the Americas, they always ask, where is your language? You know, why don't you speak the words? You know, as if to say that there, there is no so-called brown skinned people that still retain the language or still speak it or are learning to speak it, you know? So we're going to be looking at all of these things. So again, this is probably going to go on for maybe three to four parts. Wow. So let's go to the screen share. Professor, I see you've been digging in the crates. Yeah, so for this one, it's gained. It's a lot. Again, it's gonna be quite a lot to get through for you guys. Um, some of it's going to be cross-referencing as well, um, just to show you, you know, to emphasize certain things, so you can see, you know, where my train of thought is coming from. So hopefully, I should be screen sharing now. Yeah, you're good, professor, and in HD. 
Okay, so the first thing that we're going to start on today, this is Algonquian or Algonquian words in American English, a study in the contact of the white man and the Indian. Okay, as you can see here as well. So this is the first opening page of the document. So it says an important aspect of the contact of the white man and the Indian, no less than an interesting and valuable branch of folklore is concerned with the words which the Aborigines of the New World have transmitted to the oral and the written speech of their conquerors and supplanters. Their contributions to American English have not yet been determined with anything like an approach to accuracy. Enough is known, however, to justify the statement that the Indian element is much larger than is commonly believed to be the case. The Algonquian alone, one of the 58 distinct linguistic stocks, many are of no vital importance in this matter, recognized to exist north of the Mexican boundary line, the language of Pocahontas, King Philip, Pontiac, Tecumseh, Black Hawk, and the other men and women famous during the earlier and later years of the nation's beginning. The eras of colonization and expansion has furnished to our common English tongue a surprisingly large number of words so familiar and so much in evidence, both in ordinary conversation and in literature, that their Indian origin is often little suspected, if at all. So such for example are chipmunk, hickory, hominy, moose, mugwump, pemmican, persimmon, pone, possum, raccoon, skunk, squash, tammany, terrapin, tomahawk, totem, woodchuck, etc. Of these, tammany and mugwump have of late years become almost as familiar to the English overseas as to us in America. And the same may be said of caucus, if that be Indian. Mm. So you know your so-called black caucus? Caucus is an Algonquian word in case you didn't know. Wow. So totem, by reason of his adoption in anthropology, has practically achieved world citizenship in the language of science. In the local speech of New England, especially among the fishermen of its coasts and islands, many words of Algonquian origin not familiar to the general public are still preserved, and many more were once current, but have died out within the last 100 years. A foregoing study of all unpublished material in the nature of diaries, sermons, addresses, etc. epoch would doubtless reveal many of life was but short. Professor? Okay, give me a minute. Yeah, sorry. It's a bit laggy today. Yeah, you picked out twice, but please continue. There we go. Right. So the chief contributions, however, which the dialects of the widespread Algonquian stock have made to English speech in America are contained in the list following. So words of Algonquian origin in American English. So word number one is apishamo, a word used in the West for a saddle blanket made of buffalo calf skins. The suggested derivation from French uh, impediment is not to be entertained. In Ojibwa related dialects, apishamon signifies anything to lie down upon from a heap of ferns or fir branches to a blanket or a bed, or the cognate words apikweshamon and apik and apishkamon mean respectively a pillow and the piece of bark on which the paddler in a canoe kneels. The standard dictionary gives apishamor also the meaning of bed. Okay, word number two now is asimina, or you've also got another spelling that has two S's. So a name for the North American pawpaw, asimina triloba. The word which is probably coming to English from the asimina or Louisianan and Canadian French is derived ultimately perhaps from the Illinois language. According to Dr. J. H. Trumbull, the older and etymologically the more correct form is racemina, representing an Illinois racemina, in which raci equals divided lengthwise in equal parts, while min is a characteristic Algonquian root for seed, fruit, berry, etc. 
a derivation from asin, stone, and min through is hardly tenable. So next word, number three, is asapan, a name almost solely a dictionary term for the flying squirrel, which is known as the Sciuropetrus uh, volucella. The form asapanic is also in the dictionaries. The word is derived from one of the southeastern dialects. Uh, word 3a is babish, thong of leather, thong made from skins of various animals, particularly eel skin, through Canadian French, in which the word is very old, probably from old Mi'kmaq, ababish, string, cord, cognate with Ojibwa, asababis, etc. And if we have number four, which is cantico or canticoi, a word formerly much in use in the eastern part of the United States. Among the Dutch and early English colonists between Massachusetts and Virginia, cantico, spelt in a variety of ways, signified one, a dancing party, two, social gathering of a lively sort, three, jollification. The last signification is not yet extinct in American English. In the literature of the 17th century, cantico was both noun and verb, and phrases like to cut a cantico were also employed. The word as the Virginian canticon, dance, canticani, sorry, canticanti, dance and sing, the Lenape genticon, to sing, dance, etc., indicate is derived from one of the southeastern Algonquian dialects. In the Delaware, Virginian linguistic material published in 1669 by Campanius, Chinticat trans, uh, translates the hallowed be of the Lord's Prayer, and Chintica Manetta stands for Holy Ghost. According to Dr. D.G. Brinton, the radical of Cantico is can, to dance and sing at the same time. Misled by the resemblance of cantico to the Latin canter, etc., some writers have erroneously claimed a classical derivation for this Indian word, which also appears as cantico. Uh, number five is arcaju. If this word, which has come into American English from French, is of Indian origin, it is probably of the same derivation as quick hatch from Cree kikwakis, or the cognate word. In some closely related dialect, an old word in use in the Canadian Northwest to designate the wolverine or guloluscus. The meanings which caracaju has had the quite varied. From time to time, the word has meant one wolverine, two catamount, three a lynx, four a badger. Even in the 18th century, the word seems to have been confused with kinkaju or quinkaju and applied to the animal known by that name. The Circoleptus uh, cordivolvulus. In American English, as in Canadian French, carcajou means the wolverine or glutton, and certainly is not, as Bartlett states, now appropriated to the American badger, which is known as the Meles labradorica. So, six, we get to caribou. So, this name of the American reindeer, Tarandus has come into English from the French of Canada and is generally considered to be of Algonquian origin. It has, however, the appearance of a French word corrupted by the Indians, and some have considered it like the Mi'kmaq word for horse, which is tesibu, or des chevaux, which would be the French element, to be such. But its Mi'kmaq origin has recently been pointed out by Dr. A.S. Gachet. In that Indian language, the caribou is called jalabu, in quadi, megalip from its habit of shoveling the snow with its forelegs, which is done to find the food or grass covered by the snow. The Mi'kmaq Shalabu Moksadikt signifies the caribou is scratching or shoveling. The word caribou is therefore a real Mi'kmaq term with change of L to R, meaning poorer, scratcher, shoveler. Number seven is Kashaw or Kershaw, a sort of pumpkin so-called crookneck squash, derived probably from some Virginian dialect. Number eight, caucus. This word, which Bartlett defined as a private meeting of the leading politicians of a party to agree upon the plans to be pursued in an approaching election, and Norton as a meeting of partisans, congressional or otherwise, to decide upon the action to be taken by the party. 
has of late years with the legalizing of the caucus in Massachusetts, etc., and the divisions among the great political parties taken on new and wider signification. The origin of the term is by no means clear. The derivation from caucus club may after all be right. It is inserted in the list because the eminent Algonquian scholar whom Skeet, the English lexicographer, follows, proposed an etymology from one of the southeastern Algonquian dialects. See further under cockaroos. So number nine is Chebacco. So certain fishing boats used in the Newfoundland trade were called from Chebacco, the name of a place near Ipswich, Mass, where they were fitted out Chebacco boats. Through corruption, or by jesting alteration of the name, they were also known as tobacco bows. Number 10 is Chebok, one of the names of the Menhandan, probably from Narragansett. Uh, 11 is Chiquet or Chiquit. So according to Bartlett, an Indian name of the Labrus squetagu or wheat fish, retained in parts of Connecticut and Rhode Island, probably from the Narragansett or a closely related Algonquian dialects of Massachusetts. Next we have number 12, which is Chinkapin. So this name of a species of chestnut, Castanea pumila, common in the South Atlantic states is also spelt Chinquapin or Chinquapin or Chinkapin. Captain Smith gives the Virginian Indian name as Chekin Kamwin, sorry, Chekin Kanmin or Chekwin Kwamin, which makes the word of southeastern Algonquian origin. The Virginian uh, Chechinquamin may be cognate with the Ojibwe word for chestnut, which is Kitchi uh, Jawamin, literally big angular fruit. Both contain the Algonquian root min, which equals seed or fruit and the prefix great. The crappy is known also as the chinkapin perch. So number 13 is chipmunk. There can be no doubt of the Indian origin of this name, of the striped ground squirrel. So it's also known scientifically as the Sciura uh, striatus, of which many variants, chick, chipmunk or chipmunk, etc., occur. It's derived from Achi was that Achitamo, the word for squirrel in Ojibwa and some closely related dialects. The Ojibwa often nasalizes the final O, an analogy with monkey, together with the chipping of the animal, may account for the phonetic changes the word has undergone in passing into English. Long, in his vocabulary published in 1791, gives the Chippewa, Ojibwa word for squirrel, as Chetamon. And by the middle of the present century, the word was current in the English of Canada in the form of chitmunk, which clinches the etymology. The animal gets its Ojibwa name, achitamo, or achit, head first, am, which is mouth, from its habit of descending trees head first. Longfellow has the idea a little turned in the passage in Hiawafo. Take the facts of Hiawafo and the name which now he gives you, for hereafter and forever, boy shall call you Ajidumo. Tail in air, the boy shall call you. Longfellow's Ajidumo is the Ojibwa Achitamo. And the difference between head first and tail in air would only trouble the Indian. So you know what this means? This means that chipmunks come from the Americas. Number 14 is Chogset. So this name current in parts of New England for the fish, which is known as uh, Tenalabrus cerulius, known also as blue perch, kana, nibbler, etc., is derived from some uh, eastern, probably Narragansett or Massachusetts dialect. Number 15 is Siso or Cisco, a name applied to certain species of fish found in the Great Lakes and adjoining waters. One, the lake, Munai, Corrigonus hoyi, to the lake herring, Corrigonus artedi. The word is probably derived from one of the Algonquian dialects of this region. So then you've got number 16, which is Siso, wait, Sisoet, a name of the lake herring, apparently a derivative with French diminutive suffix from Cisco, but rather a corruption of Siscoit. 
number 17 is Kokarus. So this word, which is derived from the Virginian or some other Southeastern Algonquian dialect, signified in the Indian language from which it was taken, a person of distinction, chief elder, and passed early into the speech of the English colonists of Virginia, Maryland, etc., with somewhat similar meaning. In the 17th century, a member of the provincial council was called a Kokarus or Kokaros. The word seems to be a corruption of, bear with me on this one, I think that says Koko Wasu, which according to Captain John Smith signified elder in the language of Virginia. In this word, Dr. J. H. Trumbull sought the origin also of the familiar caucus. According to this view, Koko Wasu or Koko Asu would be the active intransitive or verbal adjective form signifying one who advises, urges, encourages, pushes on, a promoter, a caucuser. Cognate with the Virginian word are the abnaki, kakasoman, to encourage, incite, arouse, speak to, or jibwa, gagansoman, etc. So, professor, I, I would be one of those then, because, like, in my capacity as a DJ, I, I, you know how much I promote. So I'm a call. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll just be the promoter. Please continue. Right. So then next you got uh, Kohush or Kohosh. So with Kohosh now, it says the name of several plants. Black kohosh uh, is the black snake root or bugbane. And simisifuga racamosa, blue kohosh, is the colophyllum uh, phallictroides or score fruit or score root, sorry. White kohosh is the acte alba. The word is generally thought to be Indian and probably Algonquian. Mm -hmm. So number 19 now they've listed here is Doc Mackey. So with Doc Mackey, the vibanum acerifolium. So Bartlett says it's probably named by the Dutch, among whom the plant was used for external applications in tumors, etc., a practice learned by them from the Indians. The word seems to correspond to the Dogga Kumak, said to have been smoked by the Delawares. The IE may be a Dutch diminutive. So number 20 is Hakmatak. So this name for the larch or Larix Americana, also and more commonly known as Tamarack, is generally thought to be derived from some of the Algonquian dialects of Canada or the New England states. Per Arnold has indeed advanced the derivation from Akmatuk or Akmastuk wood for bows and arrows, but it is hard to trace this word in the dictionaries. Number 21, hickory. Hickory is the name of several species of walnut. Shell bark or shag bark hickory is known as kaya alba. Small fruited hickory, kaya microcarpa. You have white heart hickory or mocha nut, which is kaya tomentosa. Brown or broom hickory or pig nut is kaya pochina. White or swamp hickory or bitternut is kaya amara. The word hickory is derived from one of the southeast in Algonquian dialects, probably Virginian. Captain John Smith described porco hickora, a food in use among the Indians of Virginia, as a preparation of pounded walnut meats with water. And other early writers give pohickory or pehickory, etc., as the name of a species of walnut. The best view to take of the etymology of this word is that of Mr. W. W. Tuka, who holds that hickory is a corruption of the cluster words represented by Captain Smith's pohickory, the pohickory, etc., of other early writers. After the hickory have been named the following hickory bora or silen picta, hickory eucalyptus, e punctata, hickory girdler. Onsideris singulatus, hickory head, the ruddy duck, hickory nut, hickory pine, which is Pinus balfourina and P. pongens, hickory pole, party emblem, hickory shad, the gizzard shad, hickory shirt, 
a coarse cotton shirt, Old Hickory, General Andrew Jackson. So that was a nickname for mm-hmm. Andrew Jackson. So the word hickory came also into use as an adjective in the sense of tough, firm, unyielding, and sarcastically in the opposite sense. So again, this means that hickory comes from the Americas. Mm. Number 22, which is hominy. So defined by Bartlett as a food made of maize or Indian corn boiled, the maize being either coarsely ground or broken or the kernels merely hold. Now applied to several kinds of breakfast foods of which corn is the basis. The word is derived from some southeastern Algonquian dialect, probably Virginian. Among the words cited by the early writers are Virginian Rokahamin, parched corn, ground small, or you have Ushukohamun, to beat corn into meal. Narragansett is Takuminia, beat me parched or meal. Orpikomania, which is parched corn. Dr. Trumbull thought that hominy, early spellings are Hominai, homin, homini, etc., represented an Algonquian uh, homin, grain, par excellence, maize, the idea of a particular sort of maize being a secondary thought of the English speaking users of the term. But as Mr. W.W. W. Tuka has pointed out, homini is derived from the cluster words noted above. The chief radicals being aham, he beats or pounds, and min, berry fruit or mates. The well-known place name Chickahominy also contains these roots. In some parts of the South and West, the phrase hog and hominy, pork and corn, obtained considerable currency as a trite expression of the chief articles of diet. Beverly in 1705 informs us that the fin of hominy is what my Lord Bacon calls cream of maize. Hominy or hominy as he spelt it itself. He defined as Indian corn soaked, broken in a mortar, husked and then boiled in water over a gentle fire for 10 or more hours to the consistency of firmity. In the West, hominy grits is not only hulled but cracked into small bits like rice. So we have 23, which is Kenibanka, a word of comparatively recent origin used to denote the valis for clothes, which main lumber men take with them to the woods, derived with the English suffix er from Kennebunk, the name of a seaport and river in the state of Maine. Kennebunk signifies probably place of the snake. Unk equals locative um, UK. The word is from one of the main Algonquian dialects. 24 is Kilhag. This name of a sort of wooden trap used by hunters in the main woods is probably a corruption of some Micmac or Passamaquoddy word. 25 is Kinnikinnik, a mixture of tobacco with leaves and bark of sumac, red willow, known as Boy's Rouge, etc., used by Indians, half breeds, and early white settlers in the region of the Great Lakes and the Northwest. The name is also applied to various shrubs and plants whose leaves or bark were thus employed. Red osia, known as Cornus stolonifera, bearberry, which is Arctostiphilus um, uva ursi, silky cornel, which is Cornus sericea, or sericea, ground dogwood, which is Cornus canadensis, etc. The word kinnikinnik, the variants are quite numerous. You have kilikinnik, or Kanik, or Kanik, Kanek, etc., is derived from one of the dialects of the country about the Great Lakes. In all probability, Ojibwa, and signifies what is mixed, mixture. Ojibwa would be Kinikin, wait, Kinikinij, he mixes. The radical is Kinika, mixed, pell mill. Bartlett defines Kinikinik as a preparation of tobacco, sumac leaves, and willow twigs. Two first tobacco and one of the latter, gathered when the leaves commence turning red, but wisely as that the preparation of kinikinik varies in different localities with uh, and with different tribes. Dr. Trumbull notes a half dozen varieties of kinikinik in the northwest, all genuine. So number twenty-six is Kiskitomas. 
a name for the walnut or hickory, formerly common in New Jersey, Long Island, etc. The French of Illinois called this nut Noya tendra, since it could be cracked by the teeth, a fact which suggests the etymology of the Indian word. The radical is seen in the Ojibwa nin kishkibidun, I tear or rend with the teeth, Cree uh, kiski, wait, kiski sikatu. It is cut or gnawed. Abnaki neskus kadamen, I crack with the teeth. The chief root seems to be the Algonquian radical kisk to gnaw. The word is derived from one of the Algonquian dialects of the region southeast of the Great Lakes. By folk etymology, the word appears sometimes as kiski thomas. The usual form is Kiskitomas nut. So number 27, long or lunge. A common abbreviation of muscalunge or muscalunge among English speaking people in the region about the Great Lakes, especially the North Shore of Lake Ontario. See Maskinong. The standard dictionary gives the word also as Great Lake Trout. So we have 28, which is Mackinaw. This word has at least three different meanings. One, the heavy blanket, called also Mackinac blanket, from which the blanket coats of the West were made. They were formerly an important item in the trade of Mackinac, pronounced Mackinac after the French, the famous trading post between Lakes Huron and Michigan. Two, a species of bateau, or a large flatboat used by traders, etc., in this region and further west, also called Mackinac boat. Three, a species of lake trout, also called Mackinac trout. The place named Mackinac or Mackinac would represent an Ojibwa or closely related dialect Mackinac, sorry, Mackinac or turtle. The word is said to be really a shortened form of Michili Mackinac, a corruption of Michi Mackinac, big turtle. Number 29 is Mananose or maninus, a name given in Maryland, etc., to the soft-shelled clam, which is Maya arenaria, known also as the stem clam. The word is derived from one of the southeastern Algonquian dialects, probably Virginian. The form maninus is also met with. The word seems to signify the creature that digs. The number 30 is manito or manitu. This word, which has obtained a firm abiding place in literature, has signified at various times spirit, good, bad, or indifferent, god or devil of the Indians, demon, guardian, spirit, genius, loci, fetish, etc. The spelling Manitou is due to French influence. In the early writers, the word has a variety of forms, Manito, uh, Manito, or Maneto, etc., with some writers, the Manitou is the great spirit, and the evil Manitou means the devil. Not a few authorities consider that missionary influence reveals itself in such Indian expressions as Kichi Manito, the great spirit, etc. The word Manito is derived from one of the eastern Algonquian dialects, Manito, is a widespread word in this stock. In connection with the spelling Manitou, it is worthwhile noting that Cook states that in the Nipissing, a dialect very closely related to Ojibwa, Manito was formerly pronounced Manitou, as in French. The 31 is Maskinon, the name of a species of pike found in the Great Lakes and the waters in the region adjoining Essox Estor. The forms Maskalong or Muskalong and the abbreviated Long are also quite common in parts of the country. The French of Canada has masquinonge or masquinonge, representing the Indian original of the word. The Ojibwa masquinonge from mask, ugly, and kinonge, fish. In the, uh, sorry, in the English of Canada, however, as the forms masquinonge, masquinonge, lunge indicate the final has become, sorry, the final E has become mute. 32 is maycock, a word still surviving in Virginia as the name of a species of squash or pumpkin. The earlier writers cite the word in various forms, macoque, macocus, or macoqua, 
etc. And it is doubtless derived from some dialect of the Maryland, Virginia region. This word is evidently the same as the Virginian Mahawk, which means gourd, and the Lenape Machgak, which means pumpkin. So again, pumpkins are from the Americas. Mm -hmm. We get to number 33, which is Maypop, a name current in the Southern Atlantic states for the apple or fruit of the passion flower, which is a passiflora incarnata. According to Dr. J. H. Trumbull, Maypop is a corruption of maracor or maracoc, rendered apple by some of the early writers, the name of a fruit known to the Algonquian Indians of the Maryland, Virginia region. Dr. Trumbull also believes, and this is more doubtful, that Maracol through the Carib, Maracoya cited by Breton in 1665, represents the tupi in Burakua, the fruit of a vine. Professor, through the Carib, you say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just like, you know, just like in the cave, they found quite a lot of different types of like fruits and gourds and stuff like that you know these weren't things that they brought over with them these are things that you know they encountered okay so the same way how food grows independently across the whole world uh you've got to imagine that people do as well right because then who would be cultivating all this food in these different lands mm -hmm. and just as uh, brother chad said it just proves our ancestors legacy even further please continue right what we got here number 34 so menhaden so a sea fish of the herring kind which is alosa menhaden found along the coast from maine to maryland and known by many other names as the bony fish white fish hard head moss bunker or paul hagen pohagen skipborg etc according to bartlett in massachusetts Rhode Island, etc. The name Menhaden is the more common one. In New York, Moss Bunker and Skipog. In other regions, Poolhagen, Pogharden, Pogharden, sometimes cut down to Poggy, uh, Poggy or Pog. The word Menhaden is derived from the Algonquian dialect of New England. The Narragansett, uh, Munawahatek, which signifies, according to Dr. J. H. Trumbull, fertilizer or that which manures indicates that this fish and the Indians applied the same term to several other species received its name from the fact of its being used as manure for cornfields. See, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so it's kind of like uh, out of water aquaponics in a sense. Mm -hmm. And one more thing before you continue, Professor, that word that was mentioned earlier on, alosa, they say that down south when they say alosa. Mm, right. <laughs> so 35 is mephi. So the name of a fish common in the waters of the Canadian Northwest, the burbot or lota maculosa, uh, the lot of Canadian French. In Cree proper, this fish is called mihye. In Woodcree, Miffy or Mephi, from which latter dialect the word is evidently derived. A lake Mephi in the territory of Athabasca is named from this fish. So we get to number 36, which is Moccasin. So the soft skin shoe of the Indians of North America also spelt Moccasin, and formerly in other ways as well. The word is derived from one of the Eastern Algonquian dialects, the Virginian. Uh, What's that? Mokassin or Moccasin, New England, Moccasin or Mukusin, being all more or less miswritten by the early chroniclers. The same word as the Ojibwa Moccasin, after the Moccasin, have been named the following Moccasin flower, also called Indian shoe, the lady slipper, which is a cypripedium or Moccasin plant, the Moccasin fish, which is known as the Maryland sunfish. Uh, the moccasin snake, the water moccasin, um, Ancestrodon, Piscivorus, and the upland moccasin, A. atrophuscus. In some parts of the southern states, moccasin equals intoxicated was common as a slang term. Mm, interesting. We've also got number 37, which is mokak. So defined by Bartlett as a term applied to the box of birch bark in which sugar is kept 
by the Chippewa or Chippewa Indians, the word belongs to the English of the Maple Sugar region about the Great Lakes, Ontario, Michigan, etc. Mokuk or Mokok, as it is sometimes written, is the Ojibwa macaque, a bag, box, or other like res uh, receptacle of birch bark. So now we have the 37A, which is Mohawk. So from the reputation of the Mohawks, a branch of the Iroquoian stock in central New York and Canada, and one of the famous five nations, the colonists began to use the word in the sense of fierce fellow, then ruffian, tough, as the modern phrase has it. The word came thus to be applied to one of the numerous band of ruffians who infested the streets of London in the latter part of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century. Gay E.G. asks, who has not heard of the Scara's midnight fame? Who has not trembled at the Mohawk's name? Mm -hmm. In this sense, the word has usually been spelt Mohawk. Like a number of other appellations of non-Algonquian peoples, Mohawk is a word of Algonquian origin. According to Horatio Hale, Iroquois Book of Rights, page 173, Mohawk is derived from an Algonquian nickname, Mowak, or Mowawak, which is the third person plural in the sixth transition of the Algonquian word Moa, which means to eat. Uh, give me one second, guys. One. And the professor will be back momentarily. guys so <laughs> i'm actually gonna have to dash to do something um <laughs> so i can't even give you guys any more today it was supposed to be for a little bit longer but that's fine um we could do some more uh but what i will say is shout out to everybody that's in the chat um i know chad's in here rainstorm yos empress lady legs empress booth ever as well who else we got in here? I think there might be. Oh, Original Tiller. We've got American Arwax. Aboriginal Gem Finder. Okay, we've got a few people in there still. All right. But yeah. Yeah, I've got to dash and sort something out for the night. But um, I'm literally going to have to cut the stream here. But what I will say, shout out to everybody that decided to still come through. Um, we'll jump back into this piece of text. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I will show you some more words, some more origins as well. So hold tight for parts two, three, and there might be a part four. I'm not too sure yet, but um, yeah, shout out to Droid for the music. Just at my post, Professor, just at my post. And shout out to the panel, you know, on all of the live streams for the support, uh, for the information shared, and shout out to you guys as well. So I'm going to close out now. So until next time, peace. Originis, we'll be back till the next time. Watch out for notifications. We are cutting class short. Certain things have come up, but just watch out for notifications. And on that note, Originis! Peace.